Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Shahadi. I am the Women's Program Director at US Chess, and today I have a very exciting guest, International Master Annie Wang. She is the current reigning Ruth Herring Girls Tournament of Champions winner. Um, she's also an International Master, and she's going to be attending MIT in the fall. And today she's here to talk to us a little bit about winning the Herring and um, also coming back from bad position. <laughs> thank you, Annie. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. So why is that an expertise of you coming back from winning, from, from losing worse positions, right? Or losing? Yeah, for some reason, I feel like I'm the type of player that gets into bad positions easily, but then I'm better at defending those kinds of positions, really. Um, so a lot of my games kind of involve being able to play in those worst positions and then finding ways to kind of like swindle your opponent or then trick them so that you end up in a better position or in a drawn position in the end. Um, so I thought just being able to defend when you're worse is a really important skill, especially when you're like going up in rating and when you're young, because usually like most kids, you know, they're really good at tactics and stuff, but when it comes to like the more defensive stuff, it gets harder because you have to sit there and just let your opponent kind of like hit at you until you find a way to stop them from doing that and break through in your own position. Great, great. Yeah, it's such an important lesson for kids. Well, if you want to start sharing your screen, you had one game from the Southwest Open that was really memorable, right? Yeah. Um, so this is one of the games from the from this year's Southwest Chess, Clock, Chess Classic, sorry, just before everything shut down due to the pandemic. And for me, this is one of my first big tournaments in a while because in the fall of 2019, I was really busy with school and college applications and everything. So I kind of took like a bit of a short break from chess after I got my IM title. So this tournament was one of the first tournaments where I, act I was actually like coming back into like playing chess a lot and like every weekend and stuff. Um, so just to give a bit of context to this game, in this tournament I was doing fine before this, but it was kind of like one of those yo-yo tournaments, you know, like you play a lower rated, then you win, then you play up, then you lose, and you play lower rated again, and then you win. So just kind of like nothing remarkable, just a very average tournament for me. Um, but again, in this game I was paired against GM Gorovets as white, and then the round before I just won. So this is like according to schedules. Um, of like winning, losing, winning, losing. This should have been a losing game for me. So being able to actually win this game and then break out of that was really good in the context of the tournament and allowed me to actually do better in the next few rounds and then go up some rating points. So I was really happy about this, about the result. Um, so the way the game started out, it was just very standard. Hold on, it's not going forward again. There we go. Um, a bit less common of an opening, not the normal like King's Indian or Nimzo that we usually see, but still very, very standard beginning really. So D4, D6, C4, and then just kind of develop. And then now he brings his bishop out to F5. And in these positions, I don't tend to play them as often, both because I don't play them from black side and most people don't really play them from black side. So um, I had less experience in these, especially since I'm also like a younger player, obviously compared to Jim Gorbis, I don't have as much experience as he does. And so I was like starting sitting down and like getting ready to kind of think um, right here. So this is like so far totally normal. I chose to go G3 here. Um, queen b3 is also another idea, but g3 is completely fine too. And then he played knight e4 here, which I was kind of interested about because usually we don't see these kinds of knight jumps onto e4 so early in the position. So the fact that he, he went there like right now, I was getting a bit concerned, you know, like I wasn't sure if what I was doing was the right direction or the right plan. So I was, um, I was a bit concerned about my position already here, but in like, in retrospect, this is completely fine still. This is, should be like around equal, not really, like it's not worse for me. I was just a bit nervous about it. Um, but then after 94, I chose to take, he took with his bishop. And now during the game, I didn't actually think of this idea, but then when I was analyzing the game afterwards, um, I saw that the engine presented a really interesting idea about how since his bishop was on e4, it's hard for him to go back if you attack him, if that makes sense. So for instance, if you attack the bishop with, let's say like your knight, obviously you can't right now because pin, but let's say like you attack it with your knight and then he goes back. Um, the square that's most available for the bishop or like most natural for him to retreat to is actually f5 over here. So the engine presented a really interesting idea about developing the bishop to h3. So then you can cover this square and prevent his bishop uh, returning back 
to like his his side of the board later if you choose to attack it. And this idea was actually really important in the later games. This is like the idea I used when I uh, found a way, found a tactic to, uh, against Gorbets. This idea of trapping the bishop in the center with a bishop on h3. Uh, so just a bit of a, a, a small preview. Um, but after bishop takes e4, I played very normally. I went bishop g2, normal development. And then after bishop g7, I actually chose to go bishop f4 here. And bishop f4 by itself is like a perfectly fine move. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that after c5, the position does get a bit tricky for um, white. So when I was playing this, playing the game, I was really concerned that after b takes c5, black would take the pawn on b2 and essentially just like trap my rook and then win an exchange here. But then like, upon analyzing it, I found that this, like this exchange that you're giving up really doesn't matter much because once he takes it, for example, after castles and bishop, uh, bishop takes a1, with queen takes a1, you get a lot of compensation back for the bishop, both in terms of like your peace activity and then also his king side, since he, his king side now has a few holes on like g7 and the dark squares mainly. Um, so this actually would be perfectly fine for white. White's even slightly better here. So I should have gone for this probably, but I was I was concerned, so I did not. Um, and just to show what black should have should do here after D, you take c5, instead of it should be two, uh, black can just check on a5, and then after you block with the bishop, just take the pawn with the queen, and then use his active bishops just to maintain slight edge in the position. Um, so this would have been better than what I did. I castled, and the problem with castles is that after c takes d4, I can't exactly take the pawn back because after knight takes, then he has e5, which just double attacks the, oh, sorry, not e5 here. After trading, then e5, can't lose a bishop. Um, now white just loses, loses a piece, which is obviously not great for me. Um, mm -hmm. But instead of after c takes d4, there was also a really nice tactic here, which I also didn't see, um, but it's the idea of bishop h6. So we're seeing a lot of like the bishop h3 stuff here. Yeah, this was like really surprising to me. I never even thought about this during the game. Um, when I played castles, I, I was already planning on just giving up the pawn and you, you know, I'm playing a worse position. But after bishop h6, if he takes on h6, then queen takes d4, queen takes d4, double attacks the bishop and then the rook on h8. So you essentially win your piece back then, which is like such a cool tactic, it's really nice. Um, and then the idea is also that if he doesn't take, since you're still down a pawn, he can just move. But now since your bishop is gone from f4, if you take, you don't have the bishop f4 and the knight d4 uh, double attack with e5 anymore. So now you can just take the pawn back. And this just basically maintains equality in the position, which would have been really nice if I saw it. Unfortunately, I didn't see it. So then I was worse instead. Um, but instead of this bishop h6 stuff, I just went rook c1, essentially. I already thought that I lost a pawn here. So my biggest goal was kind of damage control. Like I saw I was down a pawn. And then because I didn't really look for like bishop h6 or just any like tactical ways of getting it back right now, I just saw that I kind of couldn't take it and then gave up looking. And I was like, okay, rook c1, we're just gonna go for rook c1 now um, just to keep our position as good as it can get. But if I'd seen bishop h6 here, that would have been really nice. Uh, but anyways, after rook c1, the position of the game kind of just proceeded very normally. Uh, so black went queen b6, which is very standard attacking my pawn. Uh, I went b3 here, slightly more accurate, was queen d2, just with the idea of after black castles, I have bishop h6, trying to attack his king side, and then just gaining some initiative back. And already from this, just these like few short moves, we can kind of see how the most accurate ways of playing in this, in this position aren't just like defending your pawns, but also ways of finding ways, also ways of like attacking Black's position back. Because you're already down a pawn here, if you just defend, you're probably gonna lose eventually. And then I'm also playing up like 200 points here. So I'm down on rating, down on material, and also by this point, I was also down on time. So just defending here probably wouldn't give a very good outcome. You're gonna lose eventually, most likely. Um, so the way to go here is really to attack Black's position. Um, but I didn't do any of that so far. I just played very normal after after queen b6. I moved my pawn to defend it. Uh, he developed, and I chose to go bishop d2 here with the idea of pushing e3 and then getting rid of that pawn on d4 since it's limiting the activity of my pieces. 
Um, obviously, E3 right now might be ha might have a few issues because of D3 and the pawn gets even further up in your position. But I just wanted to keep the idea in mind and then also um, prevent my bishop from getting stuck on F4. Let's say like after queen D2, E5 might come and trap the bishop. So I want bishop D2, he castled. I want E3 now. Um, D3, I remember during the game, I thought the issue was I could just go attack it essentially with something like let's say even like knight e1, trade off the bishop, and then the pawn on d3 is going to be kind of weak, so I can take that back. Uh, so that's why I wasn't too concerned about d3 there. But then after e3, he traded, I took queen a5, going to attack the a2 pawn. So I defended the pawn, he went queen a3. And then now I thought he was going for something like bishop b2 and coming in with again with the bishops first. Let's say after, if I go just to give a random move like king h1, bishop b2. First he's attacking the rook, and then also he's attacking the pawn. So I wasn't too enthusiastic about having to deal with that. So I chose to just move my rook away, rook d1, and prevent any bishop b2 ideas. Uh, so now he went queen b2. He wanted to trade queens. I'm down on material, also down on rating, so I didn't want to trade queens. So I went rook d2. Wanted to preserve just some way to attack in the future. And then now he went queen c3. And then by this point, compared to before, when he just taken my pawn on d4, um, my position is already like much improved. Before, just to give like specific numbers, after he took on, after he won the pawn on d4, I was like minus two or something. But by now, it's almost like almost equal. I'm still like I'm still worse, but it's getting close to equal. Um, so I was, I thought this position like I was already like okay, this is pretty good in comparison to what I had before. So I just kept on developing normally, and he went rookie eight. And here is when I when I came up with this really interesting idea that I saw. So I looked at his bishop here, and then the ways that his bishop can retreat, let's say if you attack it, is either bishop f5 or bishop bishop this way, right? But then his bishop, his knight is blocking his bishop on the long diagonals, which means that if you attack it, he pretty much either has to trade your knight on f3, which would be good for me because I get a bishop back, some compensation, or move the bishop back to f5. So once I saw that, I thought, oh, is there any way I can prevent his bishop from going to f5, which is how I came up with bishop h3 here. And admittedly, bishop h3 is not the most accurate move. It runs into some ideas like bishop h6, where after you take, and he can take this, still better. <laughs> bishop yeah. h3, bishop h6, that is my Exactly. So many bishop h6 and bishop h3 ideas here. Yeah, you um, foreshadowed that earlier, and I thought it was like, <laughs> oh, just the beginning, but no, it, it cracked up. This entire game. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Bishop H6, he would have still been better here. But instead, I was counting on him to go something very natural. If you look at his queen here on C3, it's really not doing much right now. It's just kind of stuck on C3, not attacking your pawns. So if your queen is kind of stuck in your enemy's territory, you'd be kind of concerned about getting it trapped, right? So then, naturally, if you know you're up material you want to play safe, the natural thing to do would just be to move your queen back, so then it doesn't trap. So I was actually counting on him going here, but then after queen a5, he runs into this knight g5 idea here, um, where it has a few components, but the main idea is that after bishop f5, I essentially have this rook, rook d5 now, and I can double attack the queen and the bishop, and after he moves, queen c7, for example, just take, win a pawn, open up his king sign, I should be better here. Um, queen h5 also looks good there, right? Ah, uh, yes. Queen h5 is probably even better. That's also good. Um, my bad. Uh, but, so, which means that he can't really go bishop f5 here. So instead of that, he has to go f5, which also runs into a few issues because now he's covered up his own retreat square for the bishop. His knight's covering up this way too. I've moved my knight, so he can't take it. So after f3, his bishop's trapped on e4. Which is, which was the main idea I was going for. Um, yeah, <laughs> I was really happy when I found this. wasn't losing anymore. Um, but anyways, after f3, since he has no way to retreat the bishop, instead he chose to attack my rook, since my rook is also trapped on d2. So essentially just giving up two bishops for the rook. And in this case, this is also a really good trade for me, because if you look at this position now, a bunch of my minor pieces are getting close to his king, his king has a bunch of weak squares, both on dark squares and the light squares now, since he moved his f pawn up. And then also his king side is weak because of, again, the f5 pawn, which I can take right away. Um, so this position is already better for me. So I was excited here. Um, 
but then he continued Queen Takes A2, which is natural. I mean, you're kind of down material. You kind of have to attack to prevent yourself from losing. Uh, so then I took the pawn, also very natural. Knight D4, attacking my queen, preparing to take the B3 pawn, and then also covering the E6 square from, you know, like queen E6, check. Let's say if he goes e A6, queen E6, and like, you know, these kinds of ideas, or king H8, and then bishop C3, getting ready to mate him essentially. Um, so knight D4 here, and then Queen d3, just moving the queen, still getting ready to keep on taking the g6 pawn with my f5 pawn, and then also attacking the knight at the same time. And then now he went queen takes b3. And then at this point, I didn't realize this during the game, but then when I looked at it after with the engine, um, this is like plus 10 for me here. But then, hey, wow. yeah, this is really good. Um, but it depends on me actually taking the knight here, which I was kind of too concerned to do during the game since the items I'm just giving up the rook here um, but as it turns out even though I'm down exchange and more than a few pawns here um, just having his king is so weak that it just makes up for all the material essentially if I just move my king king f2 can't go king g2 because of queen e oh uh, not queen e1 queen e2 check um, but after king f2 just to prevent any further checks he takes and then ignore this fair. And then after bishop takes f5, he's running into essentially a huge attack on my part with ideas of queen, G, queen g7, a queen d5, just getting mated basically after here. And there's really no good way to stop me from, to like stop the discovered attack. Also, you have to remember there's a discovered attack with the queen too. So if he goes to like f6 or something, I can go take his queen. There's just essentially no way to stop this and I'm completely winning here. So. That was a really, that would have been a really nice ending to the game, but then. Yeah, really nice um, example of the power of three pieces versus two yeah. trucks. Not a very yeah. typical uh, material imbalance, you know. You're yeah, yeah. Hearing about like three pieces for a queen. Such a nice attack. Um, but then, since it involved giving up my rook here, and then I thought, I thought I would be winning anyways after just like a queen trade. I just chose to take the queen instead, go for it the safe way. And then here, if you count like if you count the pawns and the material, I'm still like down a pawn here. He has six pawns. I have four. I have an extra point from the two uh, two pieces for the rook though, but I'm still down a pawn. But then just looking at the position, I thought because I have like my pieces are so active and like even now still kind of threatening the king, um, I thought it should definitely make up for the compensation for the pawn. So I have like plenty of compensation for that. So I was really happy to go with this as well. Uh, so then after bishops. Bishop c3, he went knight c5. But I, the problem with just taking right now is that after this, like, even though we don't have any queens, the king is still in trouble. Like, bishop e6, bishop h7, getting ready to get, uh, getting ready to mate black still. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this part was also nice. Um, but that's why essentially you can't take the pawn here on f5. So he just moved back instead. I took the pawn now, opening up this diagonal and just ideas with this light squared bishop of attacking box king you took i went 96 here um with idea of first like 97 and then also he can't take the knight here again because of the bishops here as long as if i just go like rook d4 or something this king is kind of stuck on the h file and then pretty much i'm going to i'm just going to be able to attack his king and then win some material or like mate him if i get lucky uh so after 96 Went ninety four. If rookie eight, he runs into some discovered attacks with the bishop and the knight. You have to be a bit careful here though, because like trading two pieces for the rook isn't that great in this position. But then you do have those kinds of ideas, which, which also like makes this position good for you. Uh, but after ninety four, attacking the bishop here, so ninety seven isn't an option right now. Um, but I just move the bishop. He went rook c8, very natural, developing the rook. His rook was on a8 before. And then I chose to move my bishop back now. Since if you look at the position, it's getting kind of hard for you to attack black's king. Because um, since, especially with the addition of his knight over here, his knight has, if I move my knight, for example, to f4 with the idea of bishop e6, he has like knight g5, for instance, which just covers the e6 square. And now he's getting ready to go like e4, uh, e5, sorry which isn't that great for me, which because that means his pieces are getting active too. And if his pieces get active, then my, my advantage 
won't be as great because my advantage largely comes from peace activity and my initiative right here. So I wanted to go for a way where I could keep on attacking him while also preventing him from attacking me back. So which is why I just went for bishop g2 here with the idea of after he moves, I can just take the pawn on b7 and now essentially I'm going to go trap his rook. Um, just a slight note of rook c4. Rook c4 is just met by bishop takes f6 and then e takes bishop d5 and I have like but, and I have discovered attacks again uh, with the bishop and the knight, which just means I'm going to win one of the rooks back, at least, and I'm just going to be up a piece in the endgame. Um, just to give a concrete example, like, for instance, I'm just up a piece here. Like, he has a few pawns, but they're just pawns, and I have a piece, so I should be able to win this easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the road, the way he went, essentially went into a similar position. I defended for a bit, now I'm going for it. bishop takes a7, and then again, we see how powerful the bishops and your knights uh, and the knights are here, because his rooks are essentially just being trapped onto the back rank, and with all of my pieces coming forward, there's no way for him, uh, for my opponent to successfully, like, either activate his rooks or prevent me from attacking him, so he's just sitting there, and I'm just going forward to take his pieces. Like, especially bishop H a7 here, even though you see that I'm going to take the pawn, it's hard for you to stop me from taking the pawn. So he just went a5, I just went bishop a7, a4, took, took the rook back, now I'm up a piece. Um, he has a pawn for the piece, which admittedly isn't much. So I just played very calmly, essentially. Went around oh, with idea of bishop e8 to take this pawn, because after rook e8, this 97 doubling, uh, double attacking, sorry, double attacking the rook and the king, so just winning more material. So after that, this king g7, and so essentially, I just took the pawn, and then after I took the pawn, he resigned. Um, that was such an awesome game, Annie, and, you know, it really showed us, like, the your fighting spirit and some great bishop h6 and bishop h3 tactics. I think you also had one position you wanted to share from your recent 6-0 sweep of preparing <laughs> um, a National Girls Tournament Champions. I love that event. You earned, I think, a $2,000 scholarship. Oh, I'm not too sure either. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't gotten all the facts straight yet. But there, I, my my friend actually, um, Richard Tiffrin supports that event, and I was really excited to see big names like you and Jen Yu playing it. Um, and yeah, it's it's always nice to get a little um, extra pocket change for MIT, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so, do you want to show us like one fun example from that event? Sure. Uh, I just wanted to show a position or a few positions rather for my last game in the tournament against Anne-Marie Vallea. Um, and essentially this position, it was, I was like already, if I drew, I would have like secured first. So there is some temptation just for me to like accept a draw early. She actually offered me a draw around like move 10, I think. And I was really tempted just to take it, you know, and then like take home the prize money. Um, but I decided to play on instead. So eventually we got to this end game where we traded into we traded into an opposite colored bishop ending, which should really be like drawn if you look at it. The only potential weakness for white is the c3 pawn right here, but then he can easily defend that with, let's say, like bishop c5, bishop b4 idea, so there's not really much for me to attack. And this kind of goes in opposition to what happened the previous game that I showed, because uh, in that game I was worse, and then I found ways to like work against my opponent's advantage to win, and this one is just essentially equal, it's completely equal here. And then I found ways of rather um, explaining my opponent's mistakes to make the position better for me instead. Um, so essentially there's not as many like variations in this one, it's just general ideas. But essentially I started out just by moving my rook up, I wanted to restrict his activity, her, uh, her activity rather, her activity a bit, uh, prevent her king from getting out as easily, and then also with ideas of attacking the c3 pawn like this, uh, just overall making her position harder to play for her, which makes it easier to make mistakes in. Um, so after like h4, I just continued attacking the pawn, wanted to attack this pawn a bit just to, sorry, just to force her pawns up, see how she would react to that. Not really much going on here. And then brought my king out as normal. Um, but from this position already, in comparison to a few moves ago, this looks a lot better for me than it did before. Cause now like his, her king is trapped on the first rank. My king has this like, plan of just coming in like that 
which looks really easy for me to accomplish right now. And then her book's stuck on C1, guarding her pawn, while my book is on A2, just cutting off her activity. So in comparison, this already looks much better, and which means that in like the previous moves, there's likely some way that she could have played better, maybe brought her bishop, bishop out to defend the pawn instead of using her rook to do it. But even so, in this position, it looks better, but then it should still be like foldable. This should still be a drawn position. Um, but then she continued playing slightly passively, really, like bishop d2, there's no need for you to play here. I'm not planning on rook e2, there's no advantage, there's no advantage for me. Is it not my move? Oh, it's not my move, sorry. Let's say like there's no advantage for me to play rook e2, you just go king d1, and then there's nothing I can do with my rook on e2, I'm going right back to a2 afterwards. But the fact that if you continue playing passively like this, it makes it easier for me as like your opponent to continue carrying out my plans instead of having to deal with whatever threats you're, you happen to be posing as white. Uh, so after bishop d2, I just continued with what I wanted to do before again with moving the king in. Rook b1, which, which is good, definitely. Like now you're activating the rook to get out to attack my pawns, maybe on b7, like rook b7, attack g7, or maybe also to try to cut my king off or attack my bishop so that my pieces aren't, as, uh, aren't on like such nice squares and it makes it harder for me to attack. Um, but then anyways, after rook b1, I just continued with my plan. f3, important for stopping king e4 right now uh, to get rid of the f3 pawn. I have to go e4, obviously. And then you take, because after f4, it runs into this nice e3 idea, which after bishop takes e3, rook e2, king d1, I can just take a piece here. And then, no, this is winning for me. Um, so you're forced into taking the e4 pawn, which allows my king to keep on coming in. And now... The g3 pawns and the c3 pawn are coming into a serious danger of actually like being taken now. Like now my king is actually really close to going king f3, king g3, or king d3, king c3. Um, so this already is like a bit of pressure on white's position, but still should be drawn. It's an opposite colored bishop ending. You can give up the c3 pawn and still have a drawn position here. Um, but it's important here that you take advantage of this not to continue like allowing me to push forward. Because in the game, my opponent, sorry, my opponent played bishop uh, rook b7, which moves into g5 ideas, which kicks the bishop off f4 back towards your king again, which makes you more passive, and then opens up the g3 pawn really for me to go take it, like king f3, king d3 here. Um, so instead of that, it's important that in these kinds of positions, really to find some way to attack your opponent. So rook b4 here was the key move with the idea of drawing my king over towards the c3 pawn instead of the g3 pawn. Because if we look at this position here, even with like the c3 pawn gone, it's two versus three on the king side, but it's opposite colored bishops. If you can sack the bishop for the pawn, you'll be like fine. It's drawn still. So rook b4 forces you to defend the bishop with the king, which forces the king away from the g3 pawn and towards the c3 pawn, which is good for white here. So we see how if white had taken advantage of this chance to kind of attack my position back, um, she would have been, been a, uh, she would have been able to fold a draw. Sorry, this didn't come out very clearly. Um, but so rook b4 was key here. But instead of rook b4, rook b7, which is also an attacking move, like a good idea. But then the problem is that it runs into g5 right away, which like I'm defending my position by moving my pawn to safety while also attacking your position by attacking the bishop. Um, so in this case, like your attacking move is really forcing me to attack you more which isn't helpful when you're trying to defend already against my attack, if that makes sense. Um, so after g5, just captures, and the bishop is forced back, and then my king just comes in, king d1. I could have gone just bishop b2 to take the pawn right away here, but then it's not really a big deal now. So bishop d3, the idea was so that after rook f7, I have f5 coming here, because the bishop's defending it now. And then essentially, I just went and took the pawn, and I just promoted the pawn, and then I yeah. won. Yeah. Nice. I like that game. Well, that was that constructive for sure. Um, do you mind just showing me what the other examples are? You don't have to introduce them. I'm just a little curious. Uh, I was going to show my game against Martha, where I was worse in the middle game, but then she missed like a 95 tactic, and I won a pawn. Yeah, maybe we should use just like one position and then use this for like the lesson you're thinking maybe we could do in like September or something. Uh -huh, or sure. Because I feel like it's so long and you're going to be rushed because people are going to want to ask you questions. So if you could just show uh -huh. one position against Martha, that might be better. 
Uh huh. Okay. Or I could also show I because in my game against Rochelle, it was like drawn in the end, but then she missed a tactic, and I like won in two moves basically. I so don't show that. That was that one's really short. You think that's snappier? Okay. Yeah. But for the video, I'm not sure. I haven't decided yet. So let me, yeah, let me just uh, outro this one just in case we use it. Wow, <laughs> this is this is an incredible um, victory where you were probably going to draw the game and get five and a half out of six, but now you actually swept <laughs> the event 6-0, which always feels extra special, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> uh, but uh, you also have one more example you wanted to show us from a game against Rochelle Wu. <laughs> who is a very young player. Isn't she 13? Oh, I'm, I'm not too sure. <laughs> She's a very young player, and she yeah. actually won this event, the National Girls Tournament Champions, a couple of years ago. So she won at a very extraordinarily young age. This yeah, time. she actually, the, the year she won, I was also actually playing that year. And then I remember that tournament because I accidentally flagged in round two because I got the time control wrong. <laughs> oh, no. Did you ever get a chance to play Rochelle? I didn't. Uh, like, yeah, I just didn't after I lost. ran away with it after that. I yeah, think. exactly. Yeah. Um, and that was two years ago, I think, probably, right? Uh, yeah, like probably three. two years ago, maybe yeah. three years, two or three. Yeah, so I just wanted to sh like show the ending of my game against Rochelle. Give me a sec. So in this position, I'll start from here. Mm -hmm. I'll start from here. Um, in this position, we see how I'm threatening mate on h1, queen h1 mates right away. So essentially, there's only really one thing white can do, which is block the queen with rook h4. Um, but then after rook h4, I was looking for ways to keep on attacking, really, since in the beginning in the beginning of this game, I'd been winning, but then I kind of like blew my advantage, so now it's not winning anymore. Um, but I was still looking for ways to win, so I thought the most... Uh, like the most natural continuation from this queen h1 idea would be to attack the f1 square instead, which accomplishes a similar thing, like trying to make the king. Um, so instead I went for f1 here and then queen b5. So it's, if you look at the position, it's really hard for uh, white to actually stop queen f1. In fact, there's essentially like no way to stop it other than trying to trade off the queen, let's say a queen d3. But even this, you run into ways like in the work ending, you're losing some pawns, which isn't ideal when you're playing rook endings or like really any endings in general. Um, so you can't stop queen f1 here. But then if you also look at queen f1 itself, there's not much I'm threatening to do after it. Cause after, let's say like, even if you go, pretend you go b3, which isn't a good move in itself, but after queen f1, king h, oh, king h1, now I can take the pawn. So like, that's the only big thing here that I can take the pawn in this position. Um, so if you protect the pawn, queen f1 essentially doesn't really do anything to you. You can just like check a few times and go back. So not much danger once you really look at it. But the important thing is that you do protect the pawn, which is why Rochelle played rook f4 here. So now after queen f1, pawn's protected, essentially. Um, so then in this position, I think the position should already be close to equal. Um, it might, I might be slightly better if I choose to go like queen f1 and like try to find ways to continue on with the attack here. But then I really couldn't see anything good for me after queen f1. I just saw like the few checks and I was like, oh, like this is this like looks nice, but in practice it's not actually like worth much to my position. So instead I chose to go for just taking the rook right away. Um, and with the idea here that if you take with the queen, now you're getting mated. Queen h1, since the queen was protecting h1 before, now you move the queen, so now I can go queen h1 and mate you. And then also uh, with the idea of if you go like e takes f4, I have queen h5, now mating you on h1 here, which is you hard to stop, even hard to stop, you can't actually stop it. Uh, so this is what Rochelle played, which is how I won with queen h5, just threatening mate, mate on h1. But then the thing is after queen takes f4, it's important to see that after queen f1, King h2 isn't your only option as white here. You can also go king f3, which allows you to run the king away, essentially, like just to give a few moves and then go back here. Um, but I was kind of counting on her not actually <laughs> seeing that, because just looking at it right away, e takes f4 looks the most natural. You want to stop her. You want to stop black from like checking your king a million times. And then also, it doesn't look as if black has any immediate threats after there. So just by that, the fact that she didn't see king uh, after queen f1, king f3, or after queen e takes f4, 
queen h5 and threatening mate, I essentially managed to mate her. And that, that was it. And then, that, and then that's how I won the game. So you ended up winning the tournament 6-0, um, big win. And yeah. yeah, you know, you were my, my actual current guest on Ladies Night. So it's great for people to get to know you a little bit more <laughs> as, um, you know, you're so good at presenting these these games. So maybe it's something you'll be doing more of in the future. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Annie Wang on coming back from worst position, winning the herring, and what else did I miss? What else did you teach us today? Not losing, not losing in equal positions, maybe? Okay, not losing equal positions. <laughs> Just get all the half points you can get today. Yeah, exactly. You can win the event 6 0. Um, thanks again, Annie, for not only for teaching our girls class as they're huge fans of yours, but also for doing a little excerpt for YouTube for people who can't make it who aren't eligible. I'm happy to.